Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is David Spiegelhalter. It's it's a great honour to to chair this um, meeting uh, this afternoon, a celebration of the life of, of Harvey Goldstein. And um, of course, I wish we were all together in the room in um, at the Royal Statistical Society, where I've spent so many happy hours with with Harvey. Um, but actually, in fact, this does open it up to everybody to be at home. And in, in a sense, I think this is more democratic, even if we can't actually all be there here together. So um, I've been given some instructions for uh, some notices. First of all, the event is being recorded. Um, if you don't want your contribution to be included in the recording, uh, please contact the RSS team. Um, Asking questions, uh, there's a chat box, you know, on Microsoft Teams, and you can put your question in there, and um, uh, I, I should see it, and the other speakers should be able to see it, and we'll try to answer it. But also, I think it'd be very nice, particularly at the end, um, when we got to hope to have a good time for questions, if people could actually show themselves. Um, and uh, so we, if you can raise your hand, then um, we can go over and you can see you can see yourself and you can ask the question directly to anybody here. Um, the um, everybody should keep their microphone muted during the talks and switch off their cameras if you're not actually if you're actually speaking. Um, I should add that um, in the chat you can also just put comments and nice reminiscences of Harvey um, if you'd like to do that. That'd be, that would be delightful. Um, just to quickly review the speakers that we got this afternoon, it was really lovely. We got we got Tim Cole is going to start on, and he's uh, his research interests are relate to body size and growth as exposures of outcomes employed at the Institute of Child Health since 1998 and funded by the Medical Research Council for 49 years, even longer than I was, Tim. And he's developed widely used methods for constructing growth reference and summarizing growth curves. Um, William Brown, Bill Brown, is co-director of the Centre for Multi-Level Modelling in Bristol and worked with Harvey from the late 1990s until his death. Uh, together, they co-authored 14 journal articles four software guides, three book chapters, and several, several software packages. Yeah, great stuff. Um, George Leckie is a professor of social statistics and co-director of the Center for Multi-Level Modeling at the School of Education, University of Bristol. And Katie Harron is an associate professor in quantitative methods at the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health, um, where Harvey, of course, worked. Her current research links, links data from health, education and social care at a national level in order to improve our understanding of the health of individuals from birth to young adulthood. Just can't wait to hear these contributions. And um, they've got, um, the, 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 there's a time for each talk and I hope they will leave a, you know, a little bit of time for quick questions at the end, which I'll probably read from the chat box because we want to keep, um, uh, but at the, at the very end, uh, we, as I said, we hope to have additional time for questions directly from the audience. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, Harvey, um, a respectable picture of Harvey, a slightly more um, informal picture of Harvey, as as we um, as we remember him so well. Um, uh, oh, sorry, this is me. Um, I, I, this is the uh, the um, program. Um, so now I'm moving on from uh, the general introduction to my brief reminiscences about working with Harvey and his contributions to statistics. Although, actually, I'd rather leave the contribution, general contributions to statistics to our, our, our speakers who can talk about it in, in detail, in, say, in, in more detail, in, um, in much better than I can. Uh, so I'll just make some general points. Um, obviously, sorry, that was a, a thing about the chatting. There's the chat. There's the hand raising hand. If you want to leave questions, that would be great. OK, so um, this is just an outline of Harvey's professional life. Uh, born in 1939 and then his undergraduate course in Manchester um, and then working the Institute of Child Health. I hope I got the dates right. National Children's Bureau, Institute of Education, University of Bristol. And there it is, his his life in those bald details. Um, Completely personally, I've read this. Just read this fantastic interview, um, which is so beautiful about his his family background and his early life. Uh, that's available online. Um, so certain similarities to me, but you know, our father's family came from Germany. Um, we both went to grammar school, did the same four A levels, but he got better grades than I did. 
um, went to university. We both got started with pure maths and got a bit fed up with that and moved to stats. Both did our masters at UCL, although when he did it, it was diploma because he did it everything 13 years before me. Um, there are differences. My family wasn't Jewish and I wasn't a young communist. But apart from that, there are some very strong similarities there, um, but just a difference in time. Um, I've just put on, um, you know, in, in, in at the bottom here, the books, papers, guy, medal and silver and, you know, hundreds of papers, brilliant books. Um, just looked at him on, on Google Scholar, uh, multi-level statistical models, 13,000 citations, um, are pretty good. Uh, that's that's very good indeed. And of course, he's still learning lots of citations and that will continue for a very long time. And um, if we look down uh, some of those uh, papers there, the, these are some of the works with Tanner and so on. And then uh, Bill Brown that we're going to hear more of later. Um, I don't quite know where the fourth one came from. Um, the but the 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 one I'd like to talk about is the one at the bottom here. Well, it's not at the bottom. It's near the top of his league table, I suppose, of of um, of, of of citation earners. And that was the paper we wrote together 25 years ago, and which has been very successful. Um, there it is, uh, read before the society 25 years ago. Adrian Smith in the chair. That was great. And um, and as I said, it was it was extremely. It's, I think it had quite a big impact. Where people liked it. Just a bit of stories behind it. We're going to hear about Harvey's work in multi-level modelling, which, um, for those of you who who uh, care about these things, was was done from a you might call an empirical base or a fairly classical perspective in terms of the estimation procedure. Um, I come from a Bayesian background, which essentially does the same kind of thing, um, but from a, a Bayesian perspective. But in the end, we come up with very similar um, you know, conclusions. And Harvey was working in education. I was working in health. And we were both interested in league tables. And, uh, you know, this was a very uh, early 90s. This was a very prominent thing, both in schools and in hospitals, it was the time of star ratings of hospitals and all those kind of things. And uh, and we got together, and and it's because of Harvey. Harvey made this approach. He said, "Let's write a paper together," um, and it was such fun. It was so delightful. Could you know that some collaborators trying to write something together is you know absolute nightmare. You know. If, if, arguing about every single point. With Harvey, it was just a delight. I remember getting the referee's reports back and sitting in his office at the Institute of Education with him bashing away, at, you know, furious speed, just editing the paper together. And um, it was it was really lovely. To, you know, my experience of working with him on this was, it was a complete delight. Um, just to talk about, very briefly, about some of the stuff we were doing, this is kind of, he, he was contributing about education. We're going to hear about this, about adjustment for prior achievement and about the, the real dangers of making comparisons. And I was looking at it from health. So I'd like to look at some of the health stuff. This is the kind of league table that people were producing. This is for you know, surgeons in New York State looking at risk adjusted mortality um, and uh, showing them if you look at the column one from the end, uh, that shows that Bergsland had the, the lowest mortality of about 1% and Older had the highest mortality of about 5%. So there's a ranking. Well, can we believe those rankings? Uh, you know, how confident? And it is exactly what people were doing in schools as well. So we were we were producing analyses like this, showing for those different surgeons, how co confident could you be about these risk-adjusted mortality rates? And producing um, particularly the... Um, the, the dashed lines with a little hollow dot in the middle were what the Bayesian people would call the exchangeable um, uh, you know, model or multi-level model in, in Harvey's terms. And that pulls all the estimates in and in fact makes most of the confidence intervals or the, or the intervals overlap with the central line. In other words, you can't actually be confident, particularly confident that any of them are different from average. In other words, this looks like a really false league table. And, um, you know, maybe Lajos, I'm not sure I'd want him as my surgeon or even Older as my surgeon, and I'd probably prefer to go to Bergsland. But, you know, really, uh, there's not much difference there. And even more, the Bayesian approach I was looking at, and which later, which I, I was so pleased to influence Harvey and Bill Brown and get them to implement this, um, allows um, the, to, you to put the uncertainty about the rank. So when we look at the rank of each of these individual, Bergsland, you know, is the top, 
but you can't even really be sure he's in the top half. And um, the only one you can really be sure is Lajos, bottom from the bottom, and you can be pretty confident he's in the bottom half. Now, that's about it. So it, this analysis, the sort of analysis that Harvey and I were doing was uh, you know, extraordinarily powerful in terms of being able to uh, almost demolish this idea of being able to put schools into league tables, surgeons, hospitals, particularly when schools, you know, when you look at talking about classes or whatever with, you know, rather few numbers of people. We'll hear more about that later. Um, but I just wanted to, I suppose, you know, just introduce, uh, yeah, might just reminisce a bit about my memories, of the joy of working with Harvey. Um, but now I'm going to uh, stop. I'm going to stop sharing my screen there, and I hope I've stopped sharing my screen. And now I'm going to, you know, I've done my little reflection. Um, I won't take any questions on that, but if people want to make some comments, that would be delightful. And um, I'm going to pass over to, to Tim Cole, who I've also known for a rather long time, and he's going to talk about half his formative years at the Institute of Child Health. So over to you, Tim. Uh, David, thank you very much for that invitation. And um, it's a, a great pleasure and privilege to be able to talk at this event today. And I'd like to say hi to Harvey's family, Barbara and Tom, if he's here. So I'm going to talk about um, Harvey's early career. Um, and my message is really very simple. It's his career took off at ICH. And he had a late flowering at ICH when he came back. To uh, to ICH after he'd, quote, retired, and that ICH had a big impact on his career. This is a timeline. You've already seen this from David, fortunately, so I don't have to wade through it. But the important bits for this talk are the uh, lines in bold. So he was a lecturer at the Institute of Child Health for eight years from 1964. And then um, at 65, he came back part time to um, the Institute renamed by, at that point the University College London Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. And then uh, we were able to um, celebrate his 80th birthday on the 30th of October in 2019, which was a very um, great privilege when in fact all of the speakers today spoke on that occasion as well. Now, Harvey's first publication was back in 1963, just before he came to the Institute. And um, it was a modest publication, it was just two pages, but it was in Nature, which was quite something for one's first paper. And also he appears to be senior author, although in fact he was a research assistant, and they obviously had a different sort of convention then that the last author is the last author, not the senior author. And he was doing, uh, he was comparing regression equations um, on age by sex for the numbers of chromosomes that um, could be seen in uh, slides. Now, the Institute, when he came here in 1964, was a really vibrant research community, as it has continued to be since. It was part of the University of London, it's now in UCL, but it was also linked both academically and geographically, the two buildings are back to back, with Great Ormond Street Hospital, or gosh, as it's called, which means that it has this powerful combination of research into both paediatrics and child health. Um, and it combines acad academic theory and clinical practice. So there's an awful lot going on there. There were some important people, influential people who were there when he arrived. Jim Tanner was uh, officially his boss. He was in the Department of Growth and Development. Uh, Jim Tanner had been there since 1956 and he, he was uh, became or already was and remained extremely famous as an oxologist, the word he invented, somebody who studies growth and development. And one of the things he did was to set up the Harperton Growth Study in 1948. And this was a group of children he was able to follow for the next 20 years. He invented Tanner pubertal staging. This is a way of deciding how far through puberty boys and girls have traveled by staging their secondary sexual characteristics. And it happened that he was a Monke statistician. He really was very interested in the statistics of growth and development. 
Then another person who was very influential was Michael Healy. He was a statistician. At that time, he was head of statistics at the Medical Research Council in Northwood Park. But he was also a colleague and a friend of Jim Tanner. And through him, he developed a very particular interest in child growth and contributed a lot to it. He was later a professor of statistics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And he was also awarded the Royal Statistical Society's Guy Medal in Gold. And he was a really very special statistician. Then the third influential person was Neville Butler, who was at Great Ormond Street. He was a paediatrician and he later became Professor of Child Health at Bristol. But he was really interested in child development and he was instrumental in setting up this enormous uh, cohort study in 1958 called the National Child Development Study. And it involved 16,000 babies who were born in one week in March 1958. And that cohort of um, people has been followed up since then all the way through to now. And in particular, they were followed up at age seven in 1965. In other words, just after Harvey arrived there. So all the talk would have been about the NCDS. Now, this was all to do with child growth. Uh, and child growth is my interest as well. And it's a wonderful place for statisticians to play because there are so many different ways that you can work with growth. There's so many, it applies to so many areas of statistics. And I'm just going to quickly show you some examples to give you a flavor of it using data from Tanner's Hopkins and Growth Study. And I'm going to focus on height in boys. So what we have here are data from 418 boys. And there are 4,600 odd heights plotted there, where I plotted against their age of measurement. And the age range is 0 to 20. And these data were collected over the 20 years from 1949 to 69. Now, what you've got there is a series of measurements in individuals plotted over time. But I've plotted them here, what's called cross-sectionally. So each point appears just once. I haven't joined up the points in this graph. So what can we do with data like this? Well, there's lots of things you can do with them. The first is that you can effectively produce a growth chart, the sort of chart that you as parents or children have seen that you can plot your measurements on and see how you're growing to, compared to others. And here we ignore the fact that we've got multiple measurements from individuals and we treat each point as an individual child and we can fit using a method called semi-parametric regression. We can fit these nice smooth curves through the data and they allow you to see where about your individual uh, measurement is relative to others. So the bottom line is the 0.4 centile and the top line is the 99.6 and they're equally spaced on the underlying scale. And you can then use those measurements to convert them to a, what's called a Z-score, which is uh, whereabouts you are in the distribution adjusted for age so that you sort of grow along a straight line. And here I've joined up the points plotted as Z-scores so you can see sort of that individuals are growing in horizontal straight lines till they hit puberty. And then they suddenly dip down and up again or dip up and jump up and go down again according to the timing of their puberty. Another way you can treat the data is to just take them um, in pairs. You can um, what's called treat the data conditionally, look at one measurement conditional on another. So here I'm going to be looking at height at age 13 conditioned on height at age 9. And so we can take those two pairs of measurements and plot them one against the other. So we have the height at age 13 on the y-axis and height at 9 on the x-axis. And the two are related, which is perhaps not a surprise. And you can summarize those with a linear regression line shown there with its confidence interval. And you can then add other covariates if you're interested to see how you might be growing, which might depend on your social class or your education um, and uh, so on. And this is useful for clinical assessment because it tells the doctor what height to expect when he's following somebody over time. Then the third way of approaching the data, which is actually the way that Harvey was most interested, is to treat the data longitudinally. And that means that we join up all the points for individuals so that we get a growth curve. 
And there you can see all the individual 400 odd growth curves joined up and they're color coded to distinguish between them. And you can then model these curves. You can come up with a, a statistical model which summarizes them. And it's, a, it's a, a model that uses methodology developed by Harvey called the mixed effect spline model. And it summarizes all these growth curves in terms of an average curve, which sort of runs up the middle there. Um, but I haven't plotted it, plus three numbers, random effects that are estimated for each child, which show how I've taken their individual growth curve and I've moved it around in space, up and down and twisting it. And if I do this, I can make all the individual curves sit on that band in the middle. All 400 curves are in that middle band. And the residual standard deviation is six millimeters, which shows that they all fit are really very close together. So that is a way of analyzing the data longitudinally. So we can think of these growth data in three different ways, cross-sectionally, where we take the individual points, conditionally, when we take them in pairs, and longitudinally, when we take them all together for each individual. Now, Harvey was thinking about all of this 50 years ago, and he had this, he, he uh, thought very deeply about this and uh, published on it, as his publications can show. Now, this was his first solo publication, Longitudinal Studies in the Measurement of Change, published in 1968. And it's something of a tour de force, but it's not highly cited. It's 25 pages of solid text, as you can see, and there's two figures squeezed in there. And it was a sort of manifesto about how one addresses longitudinal data, how you design longitudinal studies and analyze them. He referred to the NCDS and growth curves, data cleaning, and the software and everything that one needs. And he acknowledged Tanner and Healy. Um, and then he followed that up two years later with a paper about how to analyze longitudinal studies, the computer software you need. He described these six software programs. And he was already writing software, which he went on to uh, develop and did, uh, his career to. Um, so the important thing about longitudinal data, which the later uh, speakers will tell you all about, is that there's two levels of variability. That you've got measurements within a subject, and then you've got different subjects. So the subjects differ, and the measurements within a subject differ. This is called a multi-level structure. Now, after the Institute, Harvey went on to work in education, and in the early 80s, he heard this lecture by another eminent statistician, Frank Yates, who talked about levels of variability. And Harvey realized in that lecture that education data that he was working with child, that again are in levels, you have children within a class, class within a school, school within a local authority. That was also a multi-level structure. And he suddenly realized that growth data and education data could be seen as the same and uh, this was the basis for his later in, um, developments. And his having experienced longitudinal growth data was critical for this insight. Um, the conditional analysis, just to show, he did a study of the NCDS follow-up at seven years. He had 15,000 heights and he fitted a wonderful multiple regression model showing the effect of age and sex and all those other variables on height, their influence, their effect in terms of differences in centimeters due, for example, to a difference in birth weight or parent smoking. And then cross-sectionally, he did, uh, talked about the way of constructing growth standards, which was the first example I showed you where you produce a set of curves that um, summarize the whole population. So he published this in 1972. And then three years later, he published this, was, which was another tour de force. And this was um, a study in Cuba. He developed this um, um, project in Cuba to produce a child growth study. And this was done with Jim Tanner and also with Neville Butler. And he, this was published, as I say, in 1975. And he was talking about how, what's the best way to collect the measurements and do the calculations. Now, jumping forward to 2020, 
I also published a paper on a similar subject, sample size and sample composition for constructing growth reference centiles. And in this, I cited Hartley's paper and I kept going back to it because it was so full of wonderful insights about uh, the whole process of how you go about doing this. And it happened that I came to submit this for publication just two days after I heard that Harvey had died. And um, this uh, was clearly quite a blow. And um, I added this dedication to the paper, that the paper is dedicated to the memory of Harvey Goldstein, a valued colleague whose many eminent statisticians, statistical contributions included designing the 1972 Cuban growth study. So finally, um, Harvey for me has always been the complete statistician and I'm very glad that I was able to say this at his 80th birthday celebration, so he heard me say this then, that throughout his career Harvey has, um, he's identified important research questions and he's um, developed the methods to be able to analyze them and then he's shown how to apply the method and he's made it easy for others to repeat these methods by in terms of the software he's written and the training he's divide and provided and the documentation in terms of his many books and papers. And it is as a result of this that he has been so successful in influencing policy. So um, he was uh, a great man. Thank you. Damon. Thank you so much. Um, that I think that really means a lot to everybody to hear those stories, which I didn't know about a lot of this work, and so it is quite extraordinary those those achievements at such a uh, at the early on in his career. So thank you very much. I think we'll move on, but please um, think of some questions you'd like to ask any any member of the panel here. Um, put them in the chat, or if you want to wait, um, we'll get to the end, and you can put your um, you can indicate that you want to speak. Okay, so now I'm going to move over to uh, Bill Brown. Um, great pleasure, colleague, um, professor at University of Bristol, who will talk about Harvey's contribution to multi-level modelling. So, so thank you, David, and thank you for to Tim for for that introduction. Uh, I worked with Harvey for for quite a long time, from the mid '90s till till his death. So I'm really going to talk about. Um, a little bit about what it was like to work for Harvey and to work with Harvey and really to focus on the area of multi-level modeling uh, in terms of methodology and software. Uh, it's lovely to see Barbara and I'm not sure if Tom's out there as well and some of Harvey's friends. So I'm going to make it be a mixture of a few technical slides, but I'm hopefully going to make it accessible to the, to the general audience here. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the ground that, that Tim has gone, gone over as well. In, in so much as in terms of history, Harvey has an incredibly extensive publication list. It uh, reaches back to uh, 1963, and as, as Tim pointed out, his first paper was, it was in Nature, which is a fantastic, uh, the impressive journal to publish your first work in. Um, albeit quite a short paper, and I'll come on to the lengths of Harvey's papers in a later slide. But one thing that was evident there already was that he was interested in regression modeling, uh, because that was the st statistical technique that he used in this paper. Uh, and the regression models are really the basis of the multi-level models that I'll talk about in this talk. So really, what is regression model? Well, the idea here is in some sense, if you've got a set of data, you can see my green uh, triangles here with a blue line going through them. You're trying to find a best fitting line to that set of data. Uh, if you look at that example, it touches some of them, but what you're really trying to do is sort of minimize some metric of the di distance between uh, the points in the line. And another way of looking at that might be uh, if I draw these, these hoops, these, these bell-shaped curves at each data point, it's kind of trying to get through those, uh, maximizing the height that you go through those points or how close you go to them. And you can see that that straight line, it doesn't do a great job. Perhaps perhaps if I was able to just freehand draw, uh, we'd have a better line like that, maybe a croquet path. And maybe one of the one of my reflections really with Harvey is when, when, I, when I first came uh, to work with him in London, Every summer, the team of us at the multi-level modeling would, would head up to the end of the Piccadilly line 
uh, to this nice hotel where we'd have a lovely meal and we'd play croquet. And so there, there were a few um, a few shots of the the multi level centres, um, colleagues and uh, associates in action. In the middle, actually, that there were two very eminent. Uh, Statisticians Mike Healy, who was mentioned earlier, and uh, Toby Lewis, who were obviously a team that day. Uh, but one thing also about Harvey is he, he he loved the camera, but actually using the camera. So it's really hard. You'll see probably some repeated photos of Harvey. Here. We haven't got that many photos of Harvey to show. Uh, moving on. So as Tim said, Harvey did a lot of work on longitudinal models. The fifth of his papers uh, caught my eye. It was in a, a more statistical journal. And Tim's covered a lot of the work on growth curves, but this was really uh, longitudinal data, one, one application area where multi-level models uh, are used a lot. So what, what do we mean by multi-level models? Well, if I, if I draw the, the, uh, a similar uh, triangle of plots on, on, on the right-hand side here, you can see some of them are colored in red and some of them, some of them are colored in green. And that red and green could be schools, it could be children, it could be countries, it would depend on your application. Uh, but there is obviously some dependence there. The red, the red, dot, uh, red triangles belong to, to one school, the green ones to another. And so you'd want to account for that dependence uh, within your clustering. And that's what multi-level modeling is all about, it's about accounting for a dependency in your data. So Harvey's main, uh, he had loads of contributions, but some of his main methodological contributions were through his uh, Eagles and Riggles algorithms. So iterative generalized least squares and restricted iterative generalized least squares. And so these papers appeared uh, back in the 80s where, where he developed algorithms. He was one of many statisticians wrestling with these problems at the time, giving algorithms for fitting two level models, and then also giving unbiased estimates for those models. Um, We've heard about height and growth curves. This is not a growth curve, uh, not a height reference. Uh, um, Harvey liked to keep his writing quite concise. If you ever worked with Harvey, part of your job seemed to be to actually, uh, he liked to write his ideas down very, very neatly, uh, would be to try and expand the publication. And so he has, not only did he have loads of citations that uh, David has shown you, but his actual citation rate per page, I think would be very high compared to lots of authors. So you can see here, uh, one of his papers with Michael Healy, for example, there had three pages and over nearly 500 citations. So he's getting lots of citations per page. And actually, there seemed to be a dilution effect. If he worked with other people, they tended to extend the, out the, the papers. And so the, 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 the uh, citation rate produced. Uh, but one of the main reasons that Harvey, I think, was, was brilliant was that actually he saw that when you do statistics and when you write methodological papers, uh, to get a, a wider impact, you really have to think about the practical use of, of these methods. And so he made the shrewd decision of producing statistical software. Uh, his first package with, with his team at the time was called ML2 because it fitted two levels models. So models where there were two levels, one level of higher, higher level of clustering. Uh, that moved on to ML3 for three levels. And finally, MLN where they got up to five levels and five was thought to be a big enough number to represent in. Uh, and that came along in the mid nineties. And I, I personally started working with Harvey uh, in the mid nineties, but I joined uh, the London Research Centre, his multi-level modeling centre in 1998, where we had the, it was a long time ago and it was the, the new in innovation was Windows on a computer those days. So MLWIN was uh, the package that was being developed at the time where I worked with our, our other very much missed colleague John Rasbash. Uh, back in 1998, uh, Harvey had a, had a team with, with lots of great postdocs. He had John Rasbash, Min Yang, Heike Pan, who worked on growth curve modeling, and also a whole team because we were selling software of sales and admin staff. And the, the institute was blessed uh, with, with lots of statisticians. Fiona Steele joined uh, roughly the same time, Ian Pluis, Jeff Woodhouse, and Sally Thomas was there. And Chris Charlton, who, who's been working with Chris, uh, with, with Harvey much more recently, um, uh, was, in, was involved as a summer student at the time. And uh, as I say, we, we had an expanded team of, of what we call multi-level fellows who I think it was the, the ALCD, there was, a, there was a, a funding initiative at the time. So these people would come for monthly meetings and would join us in our, in our croquet in, in the summer. 
so John and Harvey did an awful lot of work. Uh, John leading on the program and Harvey on the statistics. And these are a couple of his the, the seminal papers. One looking at how you'd expand uh, multi-level modeling to deal with non-nested structures. Uh, and another one looking at when you have binary responses, how, how you can improve uh, the, the, the estimation methods you use in those scenarios. Um, I had to go for my own uh, my own picture album to find some more photos of Harvey. So so uh, we were all close as a team. This was my wedding uh, back in two thousand and three, uh, and with John as an usher, uh, who managed to lose lose his, lose his cravat. But Har Harvey obviously didn't did, didn't get to wear the the, the same penguin suit that, that time. But Harvey and Harvey and Barbara, you can see him in the photo on the right hand side. Uh, and I worked I worked in Har with Harvey in London for, for five years. Then Harvey retired, in quotes, in 2005, and John Rasmus took the multi-level center to Bristol. And, and Harvey basically worked at Bristol one week a month, all the way up to his death. So he would come down for a month, not often, not always in the summer, and, and would carry on working there. Fiona Steele moved, moved, moved mm -hmm. to, to, to Bristol as well. Uh, and and we, we had a team there as well. Uh, my personal reflections of working with Harvey, well, I did my PhD, uh, not with Harvey, but with David Draper in Bath. And the first time I actually met Harvey, this is a link to David's talk, was actually at that, uh, the occasion where, where they presented that paper that David talked about at the start. Uh, and Dave, my, my supervisor, David Draper, persuaded Harvey and John that it would be really interesting to, to, to look at putting these Bayesian, these Monte Carlo Markov chain methods into their, their software packages. And, and so what they did is they bought me a 200 megahertz PC, uh, which, which, is, which is far, far inferior to any, any mobile phone you have these days. It came in a cage, which, which attached it to the desk so that uh, nobody would steal the computer chips. And uh, as a result, we worked together uh, a few mad trips to London with John to put MCMC sampling into the, the software of Harvey Center. Um, I, I then joined the center after my PhD. I did one 11 month pro postdoc and then worked for three further years with John, Min and, my, uh, and Harvey. And, and as you saw earlier, I met my wife in London, but I couldn't settle down, so I moved to Nottingham. But then a, a job came up in Bristol and uh, I had children by that stage. And it was an opportunity to rejoin CMM and reconnect to Harvey. And what Harvey was really good at was getting funding. So that he'd even got funding. So if I wanted to carry on, I could have, could have stayed in the center rather than go to Nottingham. Uh, we saw this at the start. Uh, we, we have lots of publications together. Uh, so about 15% of my work uh, is joint with Harvey, much smaller proportion of his, because obviously he's written far more papers. And working with him, he's a far more prolific writer than me. So I think uh, I think I really benefited in many ways from, from working from, from Harvey. I, I think my, my only real claim to fame was to persuade him that these Bayesian methods were a good thing, although David, David might want to take the credit for that as well. Uh, and, uh, and maybe making his work slightly more verbose, which uh, I think George, who will talk after me, will also agree with. Uh, we had lots of papers together. Here's another paper where we looked at, uh, at, at new ways of expanding multi-level models to, to more complicated. And looking at how you actually describe the in those multi-level models. Uh, we did do some uh, practical work. We worked on a class size project with Peter Blatchfield and colleagues, Blatchford and colleagues in, in the Institute of Education, and also with Fiona on some, some more multi-state modeling. Uh, and I shouldn't forget uh, that uh, Harvey has also done a lot of work on missing data. Uh, James Carpenter was and Mike Kenwood were probably his main contributors there, although people like Kate Lev Levine, uh, Daniel, D Daphne Kunali, and Tony Robinson have also done lots of work here. And I was very lucky to join Harvey and James on a more recent paper looking at some of these films. Uh, and really, Harvey retired in 2005, but then he didn't really slow down. I, I tried to persuade him not to, but he, 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 after retirement, he edited a major stats journal. He was series A editor for the RSS uh, very recently. And even, even at the time of his death, well, 
while at Bristol, he was leading on a grant. He'd taken over doing our school's return, uh, our REF return, our research exercise framework return. And, uh, and this is a list, I mean, you can see, I don't know what happened in two, 2015, he wrote 12 papers. And um, even last, uh, um, in 2019, he'd written four. So he worked in Bristol with lots of people. You'll hear from George after me, I think. Uh, but many of our colleagues in the center, Liz, Chris, Fiona, Richard, Daphne, uh, Rebecca, Edmund and Lucy, but also elsewhere in Bristol. I mean, he, he had papers with Kate, Andy and Paul over in epidemiology. Uh, Simon Burgess in economics, and, and he worked, uh, uh, he collaborated to, to a degree with the, math, uh, the, the, the statisticians in the maths department. Uh, so I'm going to finish with a thank you really from me and my family. I mean, one of the benefits of Harvey, um, ha Harvey working, uh, living in London was that he would come down for, for a week every month. And so he'd come and visit. So from a growth perspective, he would have seen my, my daughters grow up from the very small girls on the left to, to girls that probably tower over him now at, at the end on the right there. So I, I, we, 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 we all miss him loads. He, 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 toy, he would give my elder daughter flute, flute advice because she's a flautist and he's a, he's a piccolo player. And, and he would play games. You'd see him running around the kitchen table with, with, with these girls that invented a game for him to play. So I just want to... Just want to say thanks a lot for Harvey for all of, all of he's done for me and my family and my colleagues. And thank you for listening. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. much. Um, you've got an echo. Um, um, yeah. Thank you, Bill. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank Lovely you. to hear Lovely those to hear stories. Them. And uh, I'm completely uh, willing to give you the credit of persuading Harvey to take up MCMC. Because now it's triggering my memory i was trying to take credit for that no it wasn't me at all no i was completely wrong it just shows after 25 years the memory you know starts starts fading for that no i i, I failed in persuading him i think he needed you to do that so thank you very much indeed so now over to uh, uh to, to, in the process to, now, and to talk, to talk about, about working in educational statistics Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Hopefully you can uh, see and hear me. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, give this talk, uh, reflecting on working with uh, Harvey. Uh, he's had a major uh, influence on, on, on my um, career to date, um, as well as being a wonderful academic uh, friend. So, uh, as I think we've, 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 we know well now, Harvey had a very long uh, career, starting in 63, with many publications in many different areas. Now, I only met Harvey in 2005, and the work that I'll be talking about today really relates to the final decade of his research, and within that, only research relating to um, educational statistics. So um, I, I also remember the first time I met Harvey, um, it, it was in uh, seminar room two in geography in Bristol. And I remember this because he gave me a copy of his textbook, his third edition. And the reason he gave me a copy of his textbook was because um, I'd been uh, strong armed into um, doing the Emma Wynn software support. And it was thought that if I had Harvey's textbook, I'd be able to give more informed responses to users of our software. Now, the problem is I didn't really understand anything in the textbook at that point in time. Uh, that didn't prevent me asking for an autograph from Harvey. Um, I hadn't yet done my PhD, so I didn't really know about correct academic behaviour, perhaps. Uh, he very politely uh, declined. Um, but it has a nice uh, ending, this story, because um, some five years later, when he was writing his fourth edition, uh, shown here, I was able to contribute and, and review a couple of his chapters. And he did give me a, uh, an acknowledgement and an autograph in the fourth edition. So it came good in the end. Now, the reason I was able to say something about his multi-level modeling book uh, in 2010, when, when he was revising it, was because he supervised me in, in between 2005 and 2010 on my PhD. And in fact, he, he took over my supervision. I was a rather kind of uh, struggling PhD student. And in 2005, Harvey had retired from the uh, Institute of Education in London, age 65, and was now only working one week a month in Bristol. And I don't think he had any intention of taking on new PhD students, uh, but he was clearly persuaded to take me on, despite not looking very promising at that point in time.
Uh, and what he did in his first PhD meeting was he handed over a bit of paper. And on that paper, there was half a page of matrix algebra. And he said a few things about it and handed it over to me and suggested that that would make a good first research chapter for my PhD. Uh, and so I went away staring at this bit of paper, struggling to work out what was going on. And for a long time, I, I kept making uh, the equations to, to because he probably would jump from one equation to the next with big jumps. And I was trying to fill in the blanks and I was convinced he'd made mistakes all over the place. And eventually I realized that he hadn't and it was all very good and it was an excellent idea. And the idea was this, that uh, school league tables, which we've heard a lot about, are providing a summary of differences in schools' performances based on um, a cohort of children who have completed their schooling. Okay, so for accountability purposes, perhaps that's informative, but for school choice purposes, it's perhaps not so relevant because if you're choosing using this information to choose a school, you want to know about the future performance of schools when your own children will be in attendance. It turns out there's a seven year gap between um, the available information published and your own child's cohort and a lot changes in seven years. So using um, cohort data from most, multiple cohorts, we could look at the instability of school effects over time. We could apply Harvey's equations, which were essentially multivariate response, multi-level models for predicting the future performance of schools. And we could show that there was even more statistical uncertainty uh, for school choice purposes than for school accountability. And we did various kinds of visualizations. As we heard, Harvey was very good at adapting to new technologies, new statistics, even later on in his career, getting into Bayesian analysis, but learned teaching himself MATLAB, for example. He was getting into R, and he liked these visualizations in R Studio. And so here's a, it's a little bit like a GDP forecasting plot. There's the performance of a school on the left and the and the kind of the uncertainty around it, the vertical variability just blows up as you try and make predictions one, two, three, all the way up to seven years ahead, which is the relevant uh, time gap for school choice purposes. Now, a nice thing about working with Harvey, um, particularly in Bristol, was he would come up for one week a month um, and, and he would go out for dinner with different colleagues every night. And I was, I was very pleased to be included in that, uh, in that company. And he quite liked these independent restaurants, which were often struggling a bit, I think. I think perhaps because they were quiet. Um, so, um, yeah, Oz and Christian's Inn are both in Bristol, but those of you familiar with the Errol Street buildings of the Royal Statistical Society might recognise Baraka, uh, an Italian restaurant around the back of the Waitrose there. And so we'd go there sometimes, and we even met up in Brisbane. Um, so Harvey had a wonderful gig uh, in his late 70s going out to um, uh, Brisbane uh, for about three months uh, of a year on an academic contract out there. And on one of those years, I managed to get out there as well. And Harvey opened up all kinds of doors for me, um, talks and workshops that I could give. And that was fabulous. But we also met up socially with, with Barbara as well. And my wife was with me and our little baby daughter. And we all had uh, lunch in this restaurant. That was lovely. But much nicer than when my baby daughter went to Baraka uh, and, and screamed in that restaurant. So that was a less good meal, perhaps. So we'd go on and do additional work on school league tables and uh, trying to quantify and communicate statistical uncertainty in different ways. And one of the ways we did this was actually building on a paper which uh, David uh, Spiegelhalter, you were involved in, a medical statistics paper, looking at uh, hospital comparisons and trying to look at alternatives to confidence intervals to communicate statistical uncertainty. So working with odds and probabilities, but also doing bespoke comparisons between limited choice sets of the type of situation that parents choosing schools would be doing. And again, this was using uh, lots of visualizations and, and, and Harvey was very good at trying to disseminate complex ideas to uh, non-statisticians essentially. So we've heard that Harvey was often behind the camera uh, and he's behind the camera here as well. Um, so uh, this is not in sunny Brisbane, this is in less sunny Somerset, um, but this was a CMM or multi-level modelling away day. So Harvey's there, there's John Rasbash, Fiona Steele, uh, Paul Clark is there, Chris Charlton and, and others as well. Uh, and this was a fabulous uh, weekend away and we did lots of multi-level modelling talks but had lots of good meals as well. And one of the things which happened there was that there was a bar and so we all had a good drink in the evening Apart from Harvey and uh, Kelvin Jones, professor of 
geography, who would sit at the bar exchanging bits of paper with one another. And what they were doing was um, writing, scribbling down the basis of uh, the paper scene here, which is a multi-level modeling based approach to measuring and explaining segregation statistics. So a lot of segregation statistics are very descriptive and we are trying to shift things into a, a model based setting and multi-level modeling was a natural way of doing that. Another very nice thing about working with um, Harvey was teaching uh, multi-level modeling workshops. And we, we did this annually at the Royal Statistical Society in London, uh, but also in Bristol. Now, here's a photo from Bristol. Uh, and it's testament to the dissemination and the importance that Harvey uh, placed in that, that these multi-level modeling workshops are still very popular today. Uh, we run multiple ones uh, per year. Uh, but when I took over uh, teaching on this multi-level modeling workshop about 10 years ago, um, I, I noticed that um, Harvey's half of the course was very sparse. Indeed, in half a day, he went through about seven slides covering nearly all of two-level multi-level modeling. And so as well as revamping uh, my, my slides, I, I also took over his slides. Uh, he didn't seem to mind. He quite enjoyed this, actually, because when presenting, he would often say things like, uh, well, I've already made this point, or I don't entirely agree with this point on the slide, or well, this is a bit repetitious, and would always smile at me when he was making these uh, these, these, these sly remarks. I would then go and correct the slides for next year, and often put in some additional slides as well, but I was never able to throw him. Despite not giving the impression of particularly reading through the slides in advance, he was always extremely capable of uh, presenting on the fly anything put in front of him that was most impressive. Uh, and one year um, at the Royal Statistical Society uh, workshop, um, I was exhausted after day one of the course and was ready to basically um, um, meet, meet Harvey the next morning at nine when we start again. Uh, but Harvey said, no, no, you must come along to my Christmas concert. So you've heard from Bill how Harvey played the uh, flute and there he is in, in, in the background. Um, and this was the annual Christmas concert. And so I went along and collapsed in the audience instead. But Harvey, with remarkable stamina, was up on stage playing uh, playing the flute. And it was very generous of him to invite me. And indeed, he invited me to dinner afterwards with Barbara and some of their friends from the orchestra. I'm not sure what they made of this uh, of this young academic in their company, but they were very gracious to include me. And I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Most recently, we've uh, taken some of these statistical modeling ideas about uh, institutional comparisons and, and trying to do um, sufficient adjustments and correct communication of uncertainty. We try to take that uh, more directly to education audiences and policy makers as well. And so we've done a kind of a long review of school league tables in England and all the official performance measures which have been there. And Harvey over time has had a great influence in, in, in shifting what the Department for Education have done um, drawing attention to, to the many limitations of different statistics that have been published in the past and has incrementally uh, encouraged them to move away from some of their worst practices, perhaps. Um, and so we've written a couple of papers there. And uh, because perhaps we've taken it more directly to these non-statistical audiences, we've had invitations to present at various places, including the National Education Union, uh, Select Committees, Department for Education and so on. And Harvey was always excellent accompanying me to all these uh, places and supporting me. Uh, and a funny story from the National Education Union was that we gave our talk and then we noticed that something was up. Okay, so this was in Liverpool about a year and a half ago, or two, about two years ago. And um, what we found out was that the next speaker was Jeremy Corbyn in the main auditorium. And so Harvey and I drifted into the main auditorium. I don't think we had tickets, but we were intrigued to see what was going on. It was bizarre, it's like a rock concert. And uh, all the teachers were, were most enthused by Jeremy Corbyn. Um, Harvey, on the other hand, was, I think, rather skeptical and uh, probably seen it all before. Uh, but it was quite fun to, um, to, to, to gate crash this uh, event. Uh, the final paper that we worked on together was actually an extension to a 2002 paper on uh, communicating and quantifying uh, clustering in multi-level models, which Harvey had written with, with Bill and others. And that paper looked at uh, the statistics for continuous and binary and ordinal and nominal outcomes, but not count outcomes. And so we extended those ideas to these multi-level Poisson models, and multi-level negative binomial models. 
Uh, now, strangely, one of the final communications with Harvey was via a chalkboard. Um, so Harvey uh, rather liked communicating via the blackboard in the office rather than by email. And it caused a great amusement when this was installed and requested uh, from the admin team. And uh, th these scribbles here are about accounting for hidden selection processes in um, school comparisons and trying to uh, find ways to, to better integrate that into value added models and so that's still something that I'm looking at now. So just to conclude, um, I, I was very grateful to give a similar talk really at Harvey's 80th uh, a year and a half ago because I, that gave me the opportunity to give him the thanks for supporting me as a, as a struggling PhD student initially but really supporting my career uh, from then on and I've had a great time collaborating with him and it's been very nice meeting up with him and, and talking about things beyond academia as well. Uh, so I was very great, grateful that I had that opportunity then. And that is just a photo from that event and you'll, you'll recognize uh, the various, uh, very, many of these faces uh, from the speakers today, but I know Harvey was very grateful um, for that um, 80th birthday celebration. So thank you very much. Uh, that's all I have to say and, and um, uh, I hope uh, there's some nice anecdotes there as well. George, thank you so much. Um, it's great to hear these stories, um, many of which I didn't know. And so always a huge pleasure to hear more stories about Harvey's life and his, his power to, to set up collaborations and to work with people with that extreme generosity. OK, so now uh, the final speaker is uh, Katie Harron from University College, who's going to talk about a journey in data linkage. Thanks so much, Katie. Can you see my slides OK? Yeah, I can see things all right. So I, um, I first started working with Harvey back in 2010 when I started my um, PhD, and we worked together on administrative data and data linkage. So today I'd like to talk about some of the lessons that I learned um, along the way. Harvey had such a huge impact on me and on my career, so I'd like to share some of that with everybody here. So it all started when we were working together on a study aiming to evaluate infection rates for children in paediatric intensive care, or PICU. We've got really good data in England on children in intensive care in a data set called PeakNet, but it doesn't routinely record information on laboratory tests for infections. That's collated separately by Public Health England. So this is where data linkage comes in. We needed to link these two separate sources of information together to be able to estimate infection rates for this group of children. So we thought, OK, this should be quite straightforward. We'll just use NHS number. That should be unique for um, all individuals and it should be recorded in these health data sets. It turned out to be not as straightforward as we hoped. We did have information on NHS number, but this was only complete for about 50% of the laboratory records at that time. And we had a number of other identifiers that we could try to use to piece together the information that we needed. But it's quite important to get the linkage right. So if the um, red line on the plot in this uh, slide is the true infection rate for children in intensive care, if we fail to link some of the records that should have linked between PCONET and the infections data, then we would miss some of the true matches and this would lead to us underestimating the uh, true infection rate. On the other hand, if we get the linkage wrong and we accidentally link records belonging to different people together, then we would overestimate the uh, infection rate because of these false matches. And if the linkage errors aren't constant over time, due to, for example, improved data quality in more recent years, then we might get the infection rate trends completely wrong. So to try and um, address some of these challenges around problems with underlying data quality and incomplete recording of identifiers, we started to look at probabilistic linkage rather than relying on deterministic linkage or exact matching of identifiers. So the idea behind probabilistic linkage is that we generate a weight or a score that represents the likelihood that two records belong to the same individual. And the way that the weight is um, generated means that information from a discriminative identifier, such as NHS number, would contribute a large 
value to the overall match rate. Something like sex, that um, for which agreement by chance is more likely, would still contribute positively, but would be a smaller value. And then something like um, disagreement on an, any identifier, such as date of birth, would contribute a penalty to the overall match rate. So probabilistic match rates are generated by summing across different identifiers. The idea is that true matches have high match rates and non-matches have low match rates. And we choose some point across this scale um, as a threshold or a cutoff for classifying records as being links or not. And where we choose that threshold to be is important. If we have a high threshold, then we can be sure that the records we've classified as links really are true matches. We've got high positive predictive value, but we trade this off against potentially missing some of the matches or having a low sensitivity. So if we decrease the threshold, we increase the sensitivity, we capture more of the true matches, but again, we trade this off against including some false matches. And where we choose this threshold to be is really important for what we infer from uh, results based on linked data. This uh, example comes from a US study that looked at the relationship between ethnicity and mortality. When the authors originally did the analysis, they found that there was no relationship between ethnicity and mortality. And this was counter to what they'd expected. They hypothesized that perhaps this was due to um, names on Hispanic records being more complicated structurally and therefore more um, difficult to link. So when they relaxed their linkage criteria or lowered the threshold, they captured more of the true matches and the hazard ratio, which represents the strength of association, was in the direction that they had originally expected, i.e. Hispanic groups had higher mortality rates. But when they did the opposite and um, tightened the linkage criteria, had a more specific criteria, the hazard ratio was reversed in the opposite direction, meaning that it appeared that Hispanic groups had lower mortality rates than non-Hispanic white groups. So this just shows the importance of getting the linkage right and understanding how choices made along the way might impact on the results um, and on the inferences that you make, make from results of linked data. So what to do about this problem, thinking back to our infection rate study. This is a, one of the first lessons that I learned from Harvey, it was about reframing the problem. So he thought, okay, if we come up with one version of this linked data set, we can't say for sure whether it's accurate or not. We know that there's some uncertainty with the way that the identifiers have been recorded and we can't necessarily improve those at this point. So how can we better represent that uncertainty? So he said we could use the information on the likelihood of a match based on these probabilistic match rates and incorporate those weights into our analysis. So this would mean that we create an analysis data set or data sets that we can use to um, understand the relationships between variables in the original data sources. So we applied this to the um, infection rate problem. We knew in our data that some records were certain links. These might, for example, have been the ones that linked on NHS number. We knew for other records, we definitely didn't have a link. And then for some of the other records, we had uncertain links and each of these would have a match rate attached to it. So one option would be to do a straightforward deterministic linkage where we only use the records that we're absolutely certain about, those that definitely linked or definitely didn't link. And this would be equivalent to a complete case analysis where we, um, where we disregard any information that has missing values. That obviously has implications in terms of sample size and statistical power and potentially selection bias. If we do a probabilistic linkage, we might include the fourth record here if that match rate um, exceeded our threshold that we'd chosen. But Harvey's suggestion was that we could improve this further. So if we think about this through a missing data lens, then our certain links and non-links are fully observed and our uncertain links are um, missing values. So if we use the information on the variables within our certain links, the relationship between the predictors and the outcomes, 
then we could impute values where these are missing or uncertain. And this is an improvement because we're using more of the data, but we still aren't using everything that we have available to us. So Harvey's idea was that we could incorporate information on the match rates into this imputation approach to more often carry over the correct value for analysis. And this um, approach is called prior informed imputation. A second lesson that I learned from Harvey was the importance of uh, engaging with stakeholders. So right from the very start of this work, um, Harvey was very keen on building relationships with the data providers and the organizations who were um, routinely linking data. So we worked with um, the Health and Social Care Information Centre as they were at the time, or NHS Digital Now, to try and explore different approaches to linking hospital data. And we worked with the team at the RNS to generate guidance on information that should be provided um, about linking data sets in order for data users to understand linkage quality and to um, think about the implications that that might have for analyses. A third lesson was to think outside the box. So Harvey and I were working on with other colleagues at ICH on studies looking at the relationship between maternal characteristics prior to and during pregnancy and infant or child outcomes. In hospital episode statistics, which is our national administrative data set uh, collecting information on admissions, we um, we have admission records for mothers who go into a hospital to deliver, and we have admission records for babies who are born in hospital. So if we could link these together, we would have a really valuable and large source of information um, about babies and mothers and their outcomes and risk factors. The problem is that these records aren't routinely linked. Babies and NHS number isn't recorded on the mother's record and vice versa. But each of these admission records also has what's known as a baby tail containing information specific to a delivery or a birth, things like gestational age or birth weight. And technically, this information should be the same for the mother and the baby. So Harvey's idea is, was that rather than looking at personal identifiers, names and addresses, things that we didn't have access to, we could use this information um, recorded in the baby tale in a probabilistic linkage to link together mothers and babies in this national data set. So you can see in this plot here the um, different clinical variables that we use for this probabilistic linkage and the way that the probabilistic linkage works. So something like GP practice, for example, agreement on that would be a good indicator of um, records belonging to the same mother-baby pair. And then disagreement in the pink there, for example, on maternal age would be a good indicator that records uh, didn't belong together. The fourth lesson was to be kind. Um, Harvey was all, always very generous and supportive of more junior colleagues. Um, following some of his initial work on data linkage, Wiley contacted him and um, suggested that he put together a textbook on data linkage. And he really pushed me forward to help with this um, at the time. And I think that that sort of generosity and kindness was a, a theme throughout his career. He, he always gave a lot of time in terms of hands-on time sitting down with you and helping to think through analyses, as well as opening up um, more broader opportunities. And I think a lot of us are grateful for that. Fifthly, don't accept the status quo. Um, most of the probabilistic linkage that's performed today is underpinned by um, methods proposed by two statisticians in the 50s and 60s, Feligi and Sunter. There are problems associated with this um, approach, mainly to do with the need to have some sort of training data to estimate initial probabilities. So Harvey took a step back and said, well, why are we, why are we all using these methods? Um, could we improve on them? So he went back to some work that he'd done um, much earlier on wrist bone maturity development in children and applied the correspondence analysis approach to the data linkage problem. So Harvey had a very good way of um, taking a different perspective, whether it was from a completely different 
field or um, a completely different approach and applying it to, to a new problem uh, to come up with solutions. And finally, um, a, a lesson on perseverance, I think. I remember when I was a PhD student at one of my first conferences telling somebody what I was working on and that person saying, oh, yeah, data linkage methods, we've got that cracked. We've been doing that for years. We know what we're doing. So sometimes it felt like when we were talking about the importance of thinking about linkage quality and linkage error, that we were sort of banging a drum that nobody really wanted to listen to. Um, as we carried on working on these methods, um, and over recent years, there's been an increasing sort of awareness of the importance of some of the issues with data um, quality and data linkage. And this was recognised in a Wellcome Trust longitudinal population studies strategy more recently. So some of the things I've learned from Harvey to summarise. Reframe the problem, engage with stakeholders, think outside of the box, be kind, don't accept, accept the status quo and persevere. And I think to add to that, keep a sense of humour as well. Thanks everybody for listening. I'm very grateful to be able to um, to speak today and if anybody would like to listen to a wonderful podcast that Harvey did just before his 80th um, birthday then um, you can find that on this link. Thank you. Katie thank you so much. I didn't know about this work it is, it is absolutely fascinating and unbelievably important. Sorry, I've got to say this because I'm, I'm, you know, work with ONS and the whole movement of statistics now, the, mo the really important work in the future is going to be merging huge data sets, administrative data sets in order to improve policy. It's been happening during COVID and this is entirely dependent on data linkage. So it's not a topic I know absolutely nothing about and I mean, you've been working away at this, you and Harvey, and it is so important and it is such a crucial issue. So I I really um, admire your um, uh, the, that effort and it's something I didn't know anything about at all. Anyway, sorry, I'm rambling on because I, I, I just so I was just so fascinated by this. OK, could the other speakers reveal themselves? if they wouldn't mind uh, let's have a look at you now um now we've got some time we've got 15 minutes or so and um, and i'm i'm going to ask uh anybody i'm going to see if there's anybody wants to ask any questions um if we can uh you know the, has anybody got any questions or comments um right there's a hand waving do you want to unmute yourself and say who you are <laughs> It might be me, David. Oh, Jane. I, Lovely to oh, see you. Okay. Yes. Great. Jane, what would you like? A comment is welcome as well about Harvey. Well, I, I was going to say, I mean, he was he was wonderfully generous, wonderfully generous to one of my PhD students, came across and spent a lot of time. Um, but I, I do actually have a question. I, I agree, David. The record linkage is, is critical in what we're going to be doing. Um, but I'm also fascinated by missing data, and in particular, data that isn't missing at random, that really is has a complicated structure of missingness. And so my question is, how does that, you've taken the ideas from missing data across into linkage, but how does the missing not at random affect your linkage? I'm not expecting an answer, sorry, but it is a, it's a question that, an answer would be nice in a few years time yeah thank you yeah katie i was thinking that because the imputation is a brilliant idea but as as jane said what happens if it's not missing at random yeah yeah point taken obviously harvey was thinking about all of these things and his legacy is definitely continuing there's lots to continue to explore exactly okay howard grant is waving i, I am harvey's oldest cousin Oh, lovely to hear from you. Right. I have known, well, <laughs> I've known Harvey. Harvey actually is one year um, old, was one year older than me. I'm the only person alive who remembers his mother who died when he was eight. Yes. And his father was my father's youngest brother. And I remember when he, my uncle, married for the first time and 
uh, Harvey then had a stepsister. Yes. And uh, they grew up, um, and Harvey, we, we tended to lose touch. The thing that impressed me most about today's talk, which I thought was wonderful, is that I didn't really understand a word you were saying. <laughs> Um, and that's only because I happen to be a pharmacist and Harvey was a statistician. Um, but uh, from a, a cousinly point of view, he was a wonderful guy, very, very caring and loving. And he and Barbara, we saw from time to time. And I must say, this is a wonderful tribute to him. And God bless wherever he is. I hope that he is well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much for those for those comments. And um, I think it's fine not to understand <laughs> anything. And I think Harvey was quite sure. The other thing that has come over is Harvey, Harvey was really cool on his maths. I mean, he could bash the stuff out and um, in a, a way that I found quite extraordinary. His uh, ability, as you said, to do matrix algebra was really something that um, could uh, impress me. If I could just add one thing, Harvey was so modest that until really until today or, or until I read the obituary, I had no idea what he did other than that he was a statistician. Oh. Nor did any of the family, I don't think, either. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I hope this has been informative to people. Now, I've got a hand up from Natalie Shlomo, if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question. Yes, I'm just wondering, Howard, are you in Cheadle? Because I used to drive him. He's got a cousin in Cheadle in Manchester that I would drive him to. to no, I'm in Bushy in Hertfordshire. Okay, but there is family. Harvey does have family in Cheadle and home in uh, Manchester. So every time he visited Manchester, I would drive him back and forth <laughs> from the university. Anyways, I'm Natalie uh, Shlomo, and I did work. And I think I probably have the last paper that uh, Harvey published with me. Um, we had a program at the Isaac Newton Institute on data linkage and anonymization. And uh, Harvey um, thought of a sort of an idea about how to anonymize data and how to quantify disclosure risks in the data. And so we uh, wrote a paper and it published in JAS, I think in 2020, I think. I mean, it's probably maybe one of his last papers uh, that he published. So I just wanted to say he was, you know, incredibly, his, his research expand enormously, you know, including, you know, getting into official statistics a bit and anonymization and privacy. And uh, he's very, very, very missed, I must say. Hey, thank you very much. That's, a, that's a, again, we're, we're all finding out things we didn't know, at least I, I certainly am. Yeah, lovely. Peter, Peter Diggle. I, I think what we've heard and certainly what I knew of Harvey's work um, exemplifies that there's a great danger in the 21st century to think that massive data sets will solve all our problems, but it's it's the fundamentals of sound statistical thinking that often get forgotten when you've got five million data points. And you know the issues about bias and framing the question and understanding really what the question is, not superficially what the question is, and understanding broad structures behind data. And the, I mean, the hierarchical structure of multi-level models is just epitomizes the way most modern statistical thinking is done, but. As Peter Green said to me earlier today on a, on a completely unrelated meeting, that far too much of machine learning implicitly assumes everything's IID. And it's understanding the structure of the problem and the context and how the data were collected that really should, you know, we should really make sure that uh, data scientists, for whom I have great respect, you know, don't forget that there are underlying principles like that underlining it, and say, epitomized by Harvey's work in the social sciences in particular. Yeah. I don't, has anybody on the panel got a, a, a commentary about that, about, you know, the, the, the structure of understanding how the data was collected being so vital in the analysis? Anybody want to comment? I'm sure we all agree. Why? Yeah, we all agree, Peter. No, it's, yeah, but a very good observation. And Harvey, I mean, I think, I mean, the other thing is that well, well, I, I love this idea of Harvey being the complete statistician, is that he did combine this mathematical rigor with you know, and the you know urge to get 
methods out there being used. And so writing software at a time when it was considered not, you know, something that we didn't do, you know, uh, academic statisticians didn't write software and things. So here's the inspiration, I think, for, for our, our efforts to do that as well. You know, we were slightly competitive, of course. So um, I, I, I think, and, and then also it's urge to get things into practice, into use. So I'd, actually, I'd like to ask, maybe George or something like that. I mean, it, it, we've heard about his impact on the world and policy and things like that. But I remember talking to him and he was you know, often frustrated at the lack of, you know, trying to get the Department for Education to listen, to take take notice of all his his the, the work that you were doing. And um, what, what, how, how would you feel that he would say about the impact that he had had? George maybe is the right person or, or anybody. Well, I, I mean, I think in terms of the uh, the school league tables and the DfE, I mean, they have taken on board a lot of the criticisms just just extremely slowly. So it was only in 2016 that uh, that a contextualisation and adjustment for prior attainment went in to the official uh, performance measures um, and became the headline statistic for the first time. Uh, but there are things like confidence intervals there now. There are some health warnings. So I think he's he'd still be exceedingly critical about a lot of it. But but nonetheless, the DfE have moved. They have improved from what they were doing in the early 90s, just rather slowly, perhaps. So that so, it's Katie's yeah. idea of perseverance, that you just have to go on for, so banging on for decades and you might actually in the end get there. Yeah. I've got the feeling that his contribution, potential contribution of, to the exams fiasco last summer uh, could have been enormous. But uh, George, could he have could he have made a difference with a fiasco that was going on? Well, uh, maybe, David, you would know more about the, the, the difficulties the Royal Statistical Society had perhaps in, in offering assistance, which perhaps wasn't, wasn't, taken, wasn't up. taken up. Yeah. <laughs> Could I, could I say on that, David? Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that I put into the chat, we have a meeting on the 8th of June. It's Joint Statistics and the Law and the Data Ethics and Governance. Um, and I've given it the title, Statistical Accuracy, Sacrifice for Public Acceptability. It's about exams in Ireland, which is where I've got that quote from, the judicial hearing in Ireland. Um, but also the four UK countries, we're covering all five countries. So just a little bit of an advertisement again online. Um, and and, and uh, I have talked to one or two people who uh, who did experience the frustrations of uh, attempting to do it. If you think about the comment about persevering, getting something done under that time scale, uh, perseverance is usually years. Mm -hmm. Years, yeah. Thanks very much. I'd just like to look in the chat. There's a nice comment from Laurence Wattier, who I remember, as I said, in 20, you know, 1994, coming to our uh, courses and uh, then following the ML Win courses. Um, and I'd just like to mention, um, if they're still here, that I'm going to go and have a drink with Sylvia Richardson in half an hour. So that's uh, we're all still, <laughs> as I said, perseverance just got to keep going decade after decade. <laughs> Are there any other comments that anyone would like to make um, before, just as we're finishing off now? Um, this uh, very nice. Stephen Whittle uh, has got his hand up if he'd like to uh, make a comment. Uh, Stephen, um, if you unmute or camera yourself. Um, Sorry. Sorry. Right. I don't know whether you can see me now. Yeah, we can see you. Well, we did briefly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. I, I'm a member of the Haringey um, Socialist Education Association. Harvey was a member for many, many years. And whenever he could, he attended our meetings. He was a, and um, of course, he was a valuable member because when we were discussing educational matters such as lead tables, how, why and how parents choose schools and the que this question of added value, he was always to, able to provide um, his point of view from a statistical point of view. And he did it in a way that enabled most of the members present at the meeting to understand. So he was able to explain matters of statistics to a lay audience in, in a very um, clear way. 
and we as members of the Haringey Education Association were Socialist Education Association were very very appreciative of the contributions that Harvey made over the years. Well, that's, thank you so much. That's really good to good to hear that. Um, and said so he's, he's just somebody who believed in putting his ideas into practice and trying to make the world a better place. Okay, I think I'm going to uh, wind this up now. Um, thank you all so much for coming along to this event, which I've, I've been completely riveting. It's been wonderful to hear to hear this. I'm also so pleased that you managed to do it on his 80th birthday. It would have been such a shame if yes. this this sort of celebration of his life only happened after he died. And mm. so I, I, I really am mm. so pleased you managed to do this. This should happen while people are alive. Oh, um, yeah. and, and all I can say is we all miss Harvey, um, you know, every time I met him. Um, Barbara, I wonder if you'd just like to say a few words just to finish off. That would be very uh, well, just if you would. Thank you. Just to say that it's been lovely seeing so many friendly place, uh, faces so many of you have met me and always been very kind and uh, completely ignoring the fact that you knew so much more of what you were talking about than I did. It's mm -hmm. lovely to see everybody mm -hmm. and thank you to RSS for this event. Barbara, that's very kind indeed, and um, I think I can do no better than to finish off with those words and to thank everybody, um, our speakers, Katie, George, Bill and Tim, and um, and the RSS for organising this, um, which I think has been uh, excellent. And although it's a shame not to be all in one room, it also enables many people to attend something like this who would not be able to do this because of um, you know the travel and the distance and so on. And so I think we, in many ways, this is gives us a big advantage to share this together. Um, so again, I'd like to thank everybody for their contributions. I'm sorry if we haven't answered all the lovely comments, people saying how what a great supporter he was of, of groups, radical statistics, smaller societies. We've heard so many good things about him and we've um, all reflected on what a kind, generous, caring um, and, and determined person that he was. It's a real pleasure to, to celebrate his life. So thank you all very much indeed, and um, goodbye now. Goodbye.